William G. Schaeffler was born in Stuttgart, Germany on August 22, 1798. He immigrated to Odessa, Russia with his parents in 1804. When he was 21, he became a Christian and soon had a call to the mission field. After serving as an independent missionary in Turkey in 1826, he made his way to the United States and entered Andover Theological Seminary. He was ordained in 1831 and returned to Turkey as a missionary where he served in Constantinople for 44 years, working with the Jews and Armenians in that city. Russia and Turkey were involved in a series of wars from the 1600s to 1918. During a 246 year period, there were only 19 years of peace. The Ottoman Empire was severely weakened from the prologue uh, warfare, and it looked like in the late 1800s, Russia would defeat Turkey. Schaffler once met with the Russian ambassador to Constantinople. Mr. Schaffler, said the Russian ambassador, I will say to you frankly that my master, the Tsar of all the Russians, will never suffer a Christian mission to set their feet in the Turkish Empire. The experienced missionary looked at him for a moment and then replied, Your Excellency, my master, the Lord Jesus Christ will never ask the Tsar of all the Russians where he may set his feet. <laughs> and Schaffler went on with his mission unintimidated by any threats. He was confident that the living God whom he served would take care for his own work. Turkey never fell to Russia, and the Russo-Turkish uh, Russo Wars finally ended in 1918. We start this year dedicating uh, Paul's charge to Timothy, who in 1 Timothy uh, 1.18 was told to war a good warfare. Man has seen war ever since Adam fell. The Old Testament is a record of fallen man in war. Since the time of Christ, the political borders have constantly been shifted by war. War is a record of hate and greed, a following Satan. 2 Peter 3, 6 says the record of, uh, before the flood perished. We really don't know how the borders were set. We really don't know what the wars were like before the flood. But in Genesis 6, 11, it says the whole world was full of violence. Full of violence, I would assume that would include war. Showing a full of man seeks to enrich himself any way he possibly can. And war is a, a major tool of that. My illustration compares Satan's carnal war of hate with God's eternal spiritual war uh, in love. War, this particular war, lasted 246 years with no real victory. All that happened is uh, treasure and uh, talents were lost with people losing their lives, livelihoods, people losing ground, all kinds of problems with no real victory. And yet a single man stood against the entire Russian Empire declaring Christ as king and not yielding to any mere man. And then he was able to continue his battle, saving who knows how many people there uh, with his mission. This spiritual battle shows that the war is not won on the battlefield, but spiritually in the hearts and minds that Christ died for. When we see our new banners this year, uh, that's what the armor of Christ looks like. And uh, we need every piece of that armor. We need it to be fortified. We need it to be strong because Satan as our enemy is a very strong enemy, which we'll look at throughout the year. But it's not what we look like on the battlefield because the battle is spiritual. We come meek. We come mild. We come with love. But yet we have to defend ourselves against the, the fiery darts of Satan. And we come only with one weapon. That is the sword of the Lord right here. And that is what gives us our victory. Our spiritual enemies are more dangerous than us. Invincible to us. There is no way we can defeat Satan on the battlefield. There is no way we can take land that Satan has taken on our own. He's powerful in ways we cannot understand, powerful in ways we cannot deal with. But 1 John 1, 4, 4 reminds us that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If we yield to Christ, follow him, we will have his victory as we allow him to work through us. Each of us is a soldier of Jesus Christ, and that's, uh, that started uh, in a war that started when Satan rebelled against God. And it will not end until Satan is finally cast into the lake of fire forevermore. Now these are the soldiers, once again, in battles with no planes, no tanks, no guns, no swords. But a battle won by faith, again, with the one offensive weapon. Showing his love in a way that the world just plain does not understand. How do we win? We die of self, that others will not die eternally. We die in the flesh, that others will live in the spirit. Now, it's the weirdest war of all time. 
Now, you look at, and there's a record of weird wars. We'll look at it in a little bit, but they look at Jericho. That was not, when I went to the Air Force Academy, we did not study how to fight like they fought in Jericho. It doesn't happen. So, spiritually, there are different ways to win. Carnally, once again, our enemies are invincible. Listen to them in uh, Ephesians 6 12. We'll be looking at it a little bit closer next week. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Flesh cannot defeat the carnal king of sin, but a single man yielding in faith to Christ can obtain his victory. Once again this year, we'll learn how to stand firm. Occupy until our king returns. Occupy until he calls us home. And we march with him as he brings forth the eternal victory march to New Jerusalem. So please stand and we'll look at uh, how this war is going to operate as we read uh, 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 10, verses 1 to 6. The 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with, uh, with uh, confidence, where I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Heavenly Father, we look at what you call us to do. We look to learn how to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We learn how to operate by the uh, way that you tell us to operate, legally, lawfully, bringing forth your love that, you're, uh, that you may then convert sinners to be fellow soldiers fighting in the battle. Lord, we know that our job is just to occupy. Our job is to take your word to bring forth your truth. We have no victory, Lord, but we uh, present the gospel to people that your victory may be won through us. And Lord, we're thankful to be able to do this. We're thankful you do use us. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us strength, you'd give us power, you'd give us understanding, you'd give us your uh, grace to show us how to go into this battle, know how to take your victory, and learn how to hear the well done when we are, give our final report to you at the BBC. And Lord, show us our enemy, show us how weak he is uh, compared to you, and show us how that you working through us can accomplish all things, because we have yielded to you and allowed you to do so. And we ask all the precious sons your name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you. Be seated. Upon graduating from Air Force Academy, I had to take the oath of office. Not going through the whole thing, but in part, that oath said, I, George Barber, have, uh, having been appointed a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. This is the same oath that Paul took as an apostle. He took an oath to defend the church of God against all enemies. Those on the outside want to take it out. Those on the outside who are enemies of Jesus Christ, as you were before you were saved, and have them come to the truth of the gospel that they may join us. And also those inside the church, which are called tares in the Bible, that come in to try to take down the church, try to divide the church, try to make the church weaker by being spies for Satan inside the church. He shows us here the battle lines in our spiritual war. As, he, as we fight against the false teachers acting as agents of Satan. Our Constitution is the Word of God. This is how, this is everything we do for practice of uh, faith, uh, how we're operating in this world. Our country is the kingdom of God. We have to stand firm, pointing all to the King who will judge the quick and the dead. And He is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Any attack, any idea in the church, anything, that the people try to bring in that separates one John or Tittle from the Bible and says we have a new way is to be rejected and rebuked and called for the false teacher either to repent or to remove, be removed. Paul knows that Satan's greatest attacks are against God's people. A church unified with Christ as head will withstand the very gates of hell according to Matthew 16, 18. Now, 
He's the foundation. But he uses us as the lively stones on top of that foundation. He uses us to learn the, uh, the gospel. He uses us to bring forth the gospel. And we are the walls that will withstand the gates of hell if we yield and build upon that foundation. Yet if terrorists come in and bring in an accursed gospel, and are allowed to influence members. Divisions will occur in that church. And Mark uh, 3.25 reminds us, and if a house be divided against itself, that house can not stand. So they bring in a new gospel, a gospel called a curse twice in the Galatians. So we bring in a new gospel and it starts separating people. All of a sudden, we're fighting among ourselves. We're not to fight among ourselves. We're to go to the gospel, find out the truth, yield to the truth, and accept that truth, and then take that truth to the world. If we fight among ourselves, we're not going to accomplish anything for Jesus Christ, which is why we need to make sure that all are pure according to this word. Now, Paul's goal is to ensure that church is unified in Christ to bring forth his sword, the Bible, and Satan's kingdom to secure Christ's victory. And he reminds us in Philippians 1.27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That means we need to be one, unified as one. We need to be an army. Now, uh, a lot of you have been in the military. They taught us that you know, the military has to operate as one. If there's, a, if there's any part that doesn't operate, there's a weakness that the enemy can exploit. So we need to make sure that this is what we follow. If there's a disagreement, in the church, that's not division. That's an opportunity for growth. And if we take it as an opportunity to grow, iron will sharpen iron, and we'll learn more as the Holy Spirit leads us. But we cannot deny any part of Scripture because we need to find a new way for a new time. To Jesus Christ. The same yesterday changed a little bit when it came, and it's going to be different in the future because Ben Man has changed, right? Is that what the verse says? <laughs> Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. Which means his word is as applicable today as when uh, it was written, as when it was thought of before the creation of the world. And that is what we need to hold on to. So, for the church to be effective, each individual must be effective for Christ. Paul here shows how the church with each, with each individual can come together and war a good warfare. So to be a good church unit, each individual soldier must do three things. First of all, he must defend your, his oath. Second, practice your call, whatever it is. You know, I was in the Air Force. You know, we have Air Force, we have Army, we have Navy, we have all kinds of different ways of military. All of them have to come together using their diverse strengths to come as one to make sure the enemy does not win. And then we need to reject deserters. So defend your oath. Paul had seen a disastrous church in his first uh, letter to the Corinthians, it was a modern church. It was a disaster. They didn't look at the Bible. They looked at their own ideas. They thought they were smarter than everyone else. They thought they should be the ones setting up other churches, not Paul. Paul doesn't have our abilities. Paul doesn't have our schooling. Paul does not have the worldly understanding of the way to approach all the idol, uh, idolaters that are in the city. We need to be the ones to teach, not Paul. They were full of pride with divisions based on carnal standing, wealth, Scholastic letters and material blessing. They're a very rich church. It was truly a modern church that would feel at home in a, a woke United States church. Not only accepting sin, but glorying in it. For 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 2, Paul shows an example of the problems they had. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife and ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he hath done this deed, and uh, might be taken away from uh, among you. They were boasting in their progressive values. They were boasting in the fact that he's in a church, he's serving God. We accept him. We accept everybody. Have we seen that in the modern churches? Satan had to change. Uh, Jesus Christ had to change. Satan had to neither. He operates the same way because it works. And we see an example of it right here. With Paul's rebukes, many did repent. 2 Corinthians is a church that is better than 1 Corinthians, but it still have a long ways to go. False teachers remained attacking him that they might get elevated. You know, if you go in and have a discussion with someone who's trying to bring a false gospel, they won't have a discussion with you. They will attack you. Um, if, I can go against, if I talk to someone about uh, predestination, 
Yevaya then uh, talk about, well, what about these verses? You just don't believe in the, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, sovereignty of Christ. You think you can do something? And they attack. They don't look at other verses. So anytime you have a different gospel with someone who's very smart, they will not discuss things with you, which is why you don't discuss with them. You present the truth. If they will listen to you, good. If they reject the truth, well, it's time to make sure that uh, you don't follow them anymore. So, he was accused of being base or low, humble and poor. Well, they used it in the negative sense. That's what we're supposed to be, right? We're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to be loving. We're supposed to be meek and mild, right? Well, this was used in a negative sense. He's a wimp. No, basically, he's just a Facebook warrior. Oh, he's tough behind that keyboard. Man, he can do attacks all day long. Boy, when he comes against us, he's scared to death. He's a coward. He won't attack us. And that's the kind of attitude they were giving him. It was definitely a false charge. Acts 9.29 says, and he, spoke, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So these same wolves, in other places, accused them of being unsaved, greedy, a filthy lucre, fickle, indecisive, uh, ignorant of proper understanding of Scripture and uh, to be trusted, and lacking in truth. You look, you look at the book of the Corinthians, he attacked, he had talked about each one of these. And we're not going to vote all these, but this is the type of uh, people that were attacking Paul. And they're trying to say, don't follow him. Look how weak he is. I have 16 doctorates. He didn't have any. He studied under Gamaliel, but that's nothing compared to now. I mean, Gamaliel's an old Jew, right? We're, we're a church. This is the kind of attacks that he was getting. An apostle? Says who? I should be an apostle. We have apostles now, right? They call themselves apostles. They claim they have uh, a new uh, way of doing miracles, a new, uh, a new uh, way of uh, moving forward. They have the same people over here. They have a new gospel, and the gospel is accursed. Paul did come meek and mild, even against his enemies. Why? To bring them repentance, giving them a chance, but bold if he needed to be. But Jeremiah 6.16 says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. These are the people Paul is coming to be bold against. These are the people that Paul is going to have the church reject, that that church can be put on a firm foundation. Um, he's going to come in. He's going to say, walk in your own paths. Follow the Christ that went to the cross. Do the things the Bible tells you to do, and you will be accepted. And a lot of them were just like the people in Jeremiah's time. We will not stand. So these are the people that Paul is going against. He was pleading for them to return to the old past instead of the new Gospels. Again, if you want to look at that, uh, look at Galatians 1, 8 to 9, we're not going to go there. But twice he called any Gospel that is one jot or one tittle away from the Word is to be called cursed. He, was not, he would stand firm and strong and be as bold as needed to be if they reject God's truth. Paul shows us how to be spiritual warriors even today. Take your oath uh, to God by repentance at the cross. Learn your call. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells, tells us, Study to show yourself, uh, thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So first of all, yeah, I went to basic training. Those of you in the military did also. We had to understand who we were fighting for, what we were fighting for, how to be a team. Then we have to learn. But that's the oath. Learn that, understand it, and make sure you're, you're uh, obedient to it. Once you're skillful with your sword, if you're attacked for a gentle call, boldly show the gospel to others as called for in his word. 2 Timothy 3.16. If, if you've been here for a very long, you probably have this memorized because we saw it. Say it a lot. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in white righteousness. Care not for his carnal advantage. The people that uh, go against the church usually have many doctrines behind them. They've recognized as people who are expert in the Bible. Well, they're expert in facts of the Bible, but without the Holy Spirit, they can't understand the truth of the Bible. And, but they will, understanding the facts, will point out the errors, will point out the uh, contradictions, will point out all the things that mankind wants to take the Bible down with. They won't study to understand that those aren't contradictions. They need to look at it uh, when God is telling us. 
but they want to be the ones that look to, not some silly preacher like me. So care not about any of their kind of advantage. Look to the Spirit, look to the Word, and follow Him. So, once again, you've taken your oath. You've gone the basics. You're looking and you understand this is the way to go. It takes a while to get there. Yeah, and believe me, I'm not close to where I need to be in understanding this Word yet. It takes uh, a while to understand the infinite God, even enough to use His weapons. But, you need to practice, the more you practice, the better you get. Hopefully I preach a little bit better than I, than I started in 2007. I definitely teach a whole lot better than I did in 1989. <laughs> but, I still need to learn more. Yeah. In the, uh, in, in, uh, the A-10, when I flew the A-10, I had to practice constantly to make sure that if the Russians decided to go over a the gap, I'd be ready. That's what we need to do. Always ready, always practicing, always working at it. The best weapons in the world are absolutely worthless. If they're not trained, if people are not trained how to use it, the A-10 is an ugly and useless thing sitting on a ramp. If we don't have a trained pilot, but if it's correctly used with a skillful pilot, it's one of the most effective weapons we have. But notice, someone has to get in that A-10. They have to start the thing up. They have to know how to use it. They have to know how to combine with someone else, and then they can take it to the battle and win. Picture in spiritual battle. If we don't know the Word of God, we can't bring the Word of God. If we don't understand the truths of God, we can't proclaim the truths of God. If we don't understand how to bring the victory to uh, the people, we can't uh, have that victory. Again, I have never saved anybody. Uh, we see these people saying, I saved 20,000 people last year. No, you didn't. You didn't save anybody. Uh, you brought forth the truth. You brought forth the gospel. If they did it, if they actually say, had people saved, he brought forth the truth, brought forth the gospel, and Jesus Christ didn't save it. That is how we fight. That's how we learn how to fight. It takes a while to get there. How many of you have, how many of you have pride problems? <laughs> we all follow Satan. We're all born in his kingdom. We, uh, we have his pride problems. So it takes a while to understand that and be able to break down that pride and bring forth his truth that people respond to him and not your arguments that will go nowhere. So, we have to understand the Bible is far more powerful than any carnal weapon. Any carnal weapon. But it must be used as intended. First, on, uh, use it on yourself that you can be a proper warrior. And then calmly to others. And unlike the A-10, the A-10 is, is a, a weapon used to bring death to the enemy, right? We bring death to ourselves and the enemy we live. It's a completely different way of operating. And it is one that takes a long time to learn how to do it. So upon salvation, we have the weapons available to us but we must use them for his glory. 1 Corinthians 2.16 For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. You have that available to you once you're saved, but it takes a long time to learn how to yield to it. It takes a long time to learn how to use it the way intended, and it takes a long time to understand that having his mind, we can learn his spiritual weapons and get his victory. Romans 12, 2 tells us, not be conformed to this world, as Corinth's false teachers were, but be transformed by renewing of your minds, letting Christ work through us. So, what are we being transformed from? Well, take a look at the world right now. We're falling farther and farther away from Christ every day, and we see what happens out there. We're being transformed from pride, lust, greed, hate, envy, and all the other sins of the flesh. These are strongholds of the mind that, of Christ, that his word can pull down. So he's talking about the pulling down of strongholds. The strongholds are spiritual things holding us back. Now, Jericho, there's a picture of a physical stronghold. There was a people that needed to be judged by God. And they were used, uh, uh, Israel was used by God to judge them and take the promised land. And what happened? Again, they did the silliest battle plan of all history. They basically had a parade for seven days. Three times they had a parade on the last day. Then he blew a trumpet. Didn't know you were that powerful, did you, Rich? <laughs> when he blew the trumpet, the strongholds all fell down. And God had the victory. That's a picture of our spiritual victories. The way we operate makes no sense to the world. It makes no sense at all. Be humble. That's what they're, they're telling you. You need to be strong. You need to be powerful. You need to have the numbers behind you. No, you don't. You need to be one person yielded to Christ. And Christ will bring all those one persons together as a body and accomplish what he needs to accomplish do that, you will have that victory. We live in the flesh. Well, guess what? 
The flesh still desires the sins of the flesh. Any of you have problems with sin anymore? <laughs> but yielding to them, if you yield to those sins, it will dull your swords, making the testimony useless and the victory lost, which is why we have to constantly go back to his word to make sure that our spirits, our flesh, excuse me, is controlled by the spirit. <clears throat> That's the only way we can have victory. Your flesh is still as simple as it always was. But the spirit can control the flesh and have victory over it if you yield to it. And we start by bringing our thoughts into captivity by fleeing youthful lusts of the flesh, called for 2 Timothy 2.22. Then studying to be a workman of the spirit, becoming a soldier, standing firm as a soldier of Jesus Christ, meditating on his word to keep our thoughts holy and not allow us to fall back into sins that so easily beset us. Philippians 4 8 calls us to think uh, upon whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, and if anything has virtue or praise. That's defined by right here. After this thinking to be holy, 2 Timothy 2 3 through 5 calls us to endure hardness as a good soldier, no longer entangling yourself in this world that you can please the who called you a soldier, uh, called you a soldier and that would be Jesus Christ. Now, ready? Take his word of light into this kingdom of darkness. Detesting idolatry, corruption, and carnal evil in this world, we bring his spiritual sword to fight against sin for the glory of Christ. Fighting an enemy invincible to the flesh with his spirit to bring souls to his cross to be saved for his glory. Now, a while ago, I haven't heard of a while ago, but a while ago they had this heresy of, um, you know, Christ is not going to return until we make the world ready for him. So we need to come together. We need to hold down strongholds. The idea was people we're going to reform themselves to make sure that this world got rid of sin to make it so Jesus could return. The most foolish thing I have ever heard of in my life. No? I can't handle one demon. If you look at demon possession, I can't handle one demon. And look at the array of Satan's power against us. And you think you're going to pull down strongholds that way? The only strongholds you pull down are strongholds of sin within you. You do that, then you can have his victory because he will then work through you. Our strongholds are torn down by the mind of Christ, allowing us to use his power, working through us to tear down carnal strongholds of this world. Strongholds easily seen today and predicted by his word. Turn to Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 20 to 32. Very familiar verses and things we need to warn the world about. Things not talked about much because, well, they're offensive. So Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 20. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto a corrupted man and of birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creator, creature, excuse me, more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women had changed the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves a recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, uh, affection implacable, uh, merciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That's a picture of the world today, and it's a picture of the church today, unfortunately. Now, what does the Bible say about the sins they're talking about? Does the Bible say that those sins will be forgiven, uh, forgiven if we don't come to the cross? Do those uh, things say that uh, we have a better way now? If you look at it, it says those people are going to hell. That hell is going to be very hot. And it's going to be eternal. 
what happens in the churches now? The churches are allowing those sins to enter into the church. They're being praised uh, there so they can build things up. What does it say? Who knowing the judgment of God, right here, uh, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They want to be affirming. They want to show their love. They want to do those things. These are the type of people that were attacking Paul. Different type of sins they're looking at, but the same idea. Satan's ways haven't changed. You're causing division. No, how can a God of love send anyone to hell? That's a good question. How can a God of love send anyone to hell? The answer to that is, he sends no one to hell. Hell is where we're going. We rebelled against God. We rebelled with those sins he's talking about. That is the standard of the way of man. We're seeing that right now as this country turns away from God. We're seeing that that is the way mankind is. His love is the way to get away from that, to come to him, to have the mind of Christ, that he will accept us as sons of God and join us as Jesus Christ, who we hated before that, who was enemies. So that is what we need to show as soldiers of Jesus Christ. So we see uh, this, that sin all through the world, honoring Satan right now. It's bad. Guess what? Heard it before many times. It's going to get worse. Meditate in the things of God and be disciplined soldiers, enduring the world for Jesus Christ, receiving his victories until called home. So as we do all this, we have to do now what Paul was going to do in 2 Corinthians. He was very clear on it. We have to reject the deserters. Verse 6 said, Paul was willing to teach the grace of Christ, seeking gentle repentance, but willing to boldly punish those who reject the grace of Christ. He had already discussed the sin in the church with the, with the man sleeping with his mother. Now see his boldness here. 1 Corinthians 5, 4 and 5 in the same section. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd say that's rather bold. But again, it was, it was with grace. It was with love. Get him over here that he can be saved. The idea is show him the error of his ways. Show him the cost of his sin in this world so it won't affect him in the afterlife. And if he rejects it, well, he's been warned. But it shows even here, being bold and bringing forth the church discipline that needed to be brought in, it was for love's sake. So he showed meekness and grace as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, but great boldness uh, against unrepentant sin. This particular man did repent. This particular man was called to be brought back into the fold because he had repented, showing that love and showing how effective it is when we follow the way of, of God by his Bible. His boldness was also on display in 1 Timothy 1.20, delivering Hymenaeus and Alexander to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. He was not a keyboard warrior by any stretch of the imagination as he was accused of. He was a strong soldier of Jesus Christ. As a body, we are to bring forth his word as a sword of the spirit, a sword which does cut, uh, cut asunder uh, body and soul uh, to allow us to become saved. And it was to free Satan's prisoners, bring them who, uh, to Christ when they were willing to yield. Again, as the soldiers, we do not kill the enemy. We bring his grace to show the way to the cross. Jude 23 reminding us, and others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. As the soldiers, again, willing to follow his example, even unto death. Why am I here preaching today? Why are all you sitting out there, saved members, in the pews? It's because our captain of our salvation, the, the one who's teaching us how to be soldiers, died for us. By his death, burial, and resurrection, we are then made alive. Well, guess what? We're his soldiers. We're called to follow his example. If we're called to follow his example, we need to be willing to go there. As a, a reminded in Romans 8, 36, 37. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We win the war by, by dying. Dying to self, first of all. That is the only way we tend to use. We die to self, and then willing to die that others may live. Now, he's not going to call us all to do that. You look uh, uh, after the Great Awakening and everything, we didn't have a lot of wars, but uh, we had a very successful country. We had a blessed country. Uh, and 
He didn't call a lot of people to die, but we have to be willing to do so. And we must also handle enemies domestic in the church, avoiding false teachers. Titus 3.10, a man as a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Now notice, it doesn't say, <coughs> someone comes in with some weird ideas. It doesn't say, no, leave. That's not what it says. After the first and second admonition reject, you sit them down. You look at the Bible with them. You say, this is what the word says. What do you, what say you? He said, you know, I haven't thought about that. Let's study that more. Okay? He's, not, he's no longer a heretic right now. He's using iron, the sharpened iron, trying to come to the truth. No, you're wrong. That's not what it says. Okay, let's look at this again. No, I'm not going to because you're wrong. Well, my friend, you were in the wrong church. There's a church down there might agree with you, but I'm going to stay with the old paths right here that I follow. That is what he's saying. You don't just immediately reject him. You try to bring repentance. But if they refuse... You don't accept them. Dealing with those causing divisions must be dealt with uh, boldly. Paul could directly punish these people. He, he was an apostle. He had a calling to do exactly that. He was establishing churches. He had that call because he needed that call. I don't have that call. I'm not an apostle. No, we have the word to show us how to do that now. But we still need to boldly do it. We deal with problems in a way to unify the body and restore each of uh, the spiritual weapons that Paul talked about. We discipline by prayer and Bible study. And if someone refuses, rejects, we still have to bring church discipline into the fold. Turn back to Matthew 18, verses 15 to 21. And this is part of our constitution if we have a problem, in our, uh, our church constitution if we have a problem. So Matthew 18, starting with verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou stand thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two or more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if uh, he shall neglect to hear them, tell him to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let uh, him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, that's the important part, in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So the idea is, that's church discipline, which is lacking in the church today. We want numbers. No, we don't want numbers. Well, I take it back. We would love to see numbers if that glorifies Jesus Christ. But that is not our goal. Our goal is to have disciples unified as one, accomplishing whatever God would have us to do. If, we, if he gives us 400 people because there's a great call, praise God. If he says, no, I'm going to show how powerful I am. You're going to have a congregation of three. But look at what I'll do through you. Praise God. But we need to follow this word. And if someone rejects it, well, first of all, Again, you, you, you bring it in, you try to cure the division. Most divisions in a church are because of lack of communication, where one person just doesn't understand. So you, you, you do the first part, oh, I'm sorry, problem solved. It does, uh, you don't do it by emails, you don't do it by uh, getting uh, people uh, to uh, hear your side. You, go, you do it by going to that person that's causing the problem. Well, if he rejects that, no, I know what I'm doing, thank you very much. You bring a couple people in, you try to lovingly point them the right way. I know, Charlie, you're wrong. Here, um, Frank, uh, this is what I said. What do you think? And you try to bring there. And if he still rejects it, then you do bring him to the church. And if he is causing divisions, he needs to be removed because he's trying to tear the church apart. But again, you treat him as a heathen publican. Do we let heathen publicans in the door? So it's not that you reject them uh, fully. It's not that you cast them to hell. It's so that they're learning how to blaspheme. They'll learn to repent. That is the whole purpose. You want them back in that pew, and you want them as part of the body, not someone causing division. So by his guidance, honor, and Christ's head, he will keep the church pure if you do it according to his way. By study, prayer, teaching, and fellowship, we can be a strong military unit for our head, Jesus Christ. And we must ensure we accept his grace and reflect that grace to others. Keeping his church pure from all enemies, foreign and domestic. He teaches by his word the way to victory. And 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know, on my own, am I ignorant of his devices? 
Yes, I am. Why am I not ignorant of his devices now? I have the battle plan right here. He sh Jesus Christ has shown me exactly how Satan operates. I know how Satan operates. He still wins many battles. But I do know how he operates. So if I can put up my defenses, I can defend against that. So as you look at it, it's setting up for this uh, entire year. We know that we're involved in an eternal war. A war with eternal spiritual consequences. For us, as well as the goals Christ calls us to obtain for his glory. We win by following the example of our Lord and Savior, the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Our weapons are spiritual. Our victory comes by reflecting the love of Christ to the enemies of Christ, showing them that the grace of Christ is available to them just as it was to you, just as it was to me. I'm no better than anyone else. I'm a sinner saved by grace. You are a sinner in need of grace. That is what the truth needs to be. And we'll spend the year learning from his word how to be effective soldiers of Jesus Christ. Being meek and humble, presenting his word, but bold for the witness of Jesus Christ. Calling for repentance for worldly sinners, but refusing to cast pearls in front of swine if they turn to see a conspiracy destroy us. Calling for repentance for sinners inside the church, and using biblical chastisement to bring erring soldiers back to a well-disciplined unit as one, fighting for Jesus Christ. Let's go into this year realizing that we are in a hot fire zone. There's no question about it. The enemy seeks to destroy us as it hates the kingdom of Christ. Refusing to take prisoners, but wanting all to join him in the lake of fire. Our captain gives us the victory, but we must be diligent and follow. If we stop practicing our warfare like soldiers in an army, we will fall into our old habits. We are still surrounded by the flesh. That's what Paul talked about in chapter 7 of Romans. He talked about, you know, those things I don't want to do, boy, I'm good at doing those. Those things I want to do, I can't do them. That's true with every single one of us. We need to have boldness. It only comes from following his word in the Bible and practicing his word in the Bible. Let us ensure we stay disciplined and sharpening each other's iron is called for in uh, Proverbs 27, 17. Lifting each other up, exhorting each other to hold the line as we build his body, growing in his grace as we unify as a body, seeking his glorious victories. And let us learn to war in good warfare. Then as we go to prayer, let us thank God for the fact he's called us to do his battle. Now, every one of us have taken that oath of office. That oath of office is written in blood. That blood is the blood of Jesus Christ shed for the remission of sins. And when we come to the cross and do it, he accepts us. We are made joint heirs of Jesus Christ right then. We are then uh, uh, adopted into God's family. I'm a son of God. I'm the only begotten son of God, but I'm a son of God. And every one of you, uh, you're sons and daughters of the Most High God, if you've accepted that grace and signed that oath of office. That oath of office comes with responsibilities. Learning how to live in a new kingdom. Learning how to hold the part of the line that he calls you to. I don't know what that is. Holy Spirit does. And he will teach you if you faithfully follow it. And then, after that, making sure we're uh, meek and mild. Understanding who we are. Sinners saved by grace, but at the same time, bold for the witness of Christ who saved us. And we will not allow them to change the word that we know is true. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, thanking him for the fact that you have him enlisted, asking him for strength to follow through, asking him for wisdom to follow through, and asking the Lord, where will you place me that I can stand fast for you? You know my strengths. You know my weaknesses. You know where to place me. Let me follow that path. Now close us in prayer, and then we'll sing what we all need to do. I have decided to follow Jesus. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, so thankful for the fact that you sent your son to the cross. You sent your son to die on that cross. That by his shed blood, we can be made uh, sons and daughters of the Most High God, joining the battle as a joint heir of the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Because we have faith in that shed blood of Christ for the remission of sins. There is no other way. There is no other path, Lord. You provide that path. And Lord, you send nobody to hell. That is where we go. But in your love, you allowed your son to die on that cross. You allowed your son to enlist us in your internal army. You allowed your son, Lord, to take, uh, allow us to take our, uh, our place in defending 
the church that he built, the church that he established as a cornerstone, the church that he uses us to defend against the very gates of hell. Lord, let us use your word, your Bible, to learn how to live that call, to learn how to get closer to you, to learn how to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, to war that good warfare. And Lord, we look forward to the victories that you will uh, have through us. Lord, we know that we can't do it on our own. It's impossible. We're carnal, sold under sin. But you have brought us your spirit. You have given us the mind of Christ. Let us yield to that mind, Lord. Let us look at your word. Let us grow closer to you. Let us uh, accept your power that we may have your victories, giving you all praise, honor, and glory. Because without you, we can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things. And Lord, let us keep that focus and remain meek and humble, understanding ourselves, and allowing you to have all victories. And Lord, we pray that you will use this church in a great and mighty way. However you see fit to use us, Lord, we are, we are willing to take our place and we are willing to serve you, providing your victories in this area. And we ask all of this in your precious son's your name. Amen. And anyway, with that, let's get ready to, uh, to do what we have to do outside of Paul Jesus and page 470. Please do stand as we prepare to sing hymn 470. I have decided to follow Jesus. Wait, you get to follow me. Ah, <laughs> 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 before us. With that, if we keep that attitude in mind, we will have his victory. We'll march together and hear those great and wonderful words. Well done, good and able servant. Thank you. You are dismissed. <laughs> 